abnormal transactions. Some kind of cyber attack on a bank. Tens of millions of dollars. Something I don't think anybody has seen before. The cyber criminal group. From the BBC World Service. The Lazarus Heist is back for season two. It was really like in the movies. Find out more at the end of this podcast. Welcome to The Inquiry with me, Tanya Beckett. One question, four expert witnesses and an answer. If you're listening to this programme on a computer or on your phone, then my voice is winging its way to you from a data server far, far away, journeying across the internet and finding a path to your device. Just like the photos you have of your friends and family, documents you're working on, music you listen to, and films that you watch, the inquiry is stored in the cloud. The cloud is a series of data centres across the world, run by technology firms which keep hold of our information and make sure it's accessible when we want to use it. Over half of all data stored by the corporate world is now kept in the cloud, and we're becoming increasingly dependent upon it. On January the 25th, multiple Microsoft cloud services were widely unavailable for 90 minutes, and the outage caused havoc for businesses, schools and people in their homes. The error was traced back to a networking problem, but it made many people wonder if the cloud itself was becoming overburdened. This week on The Inquiry, we're asking, will we ever run out of cloud storage? Part one, what is cloud storage? When I wanna go and look at a picture, I go into my device that's in my hand, I click on pictures and unbeknownst to me potentially, my pictures are that are showing up on my device I'm actually accessing that picture, that digital image from the cloud. Um, it's simply coming to me, coming to my device over my, my Wi-Fi connection. Our first expert witness works for a technology advisory firm. Ola Chowning. I'm a partner with ISG Information Services Group. When we began tapping away on computer keyboards in the 1980s, much of the information we were producing was saved either on different types of data storage disks or later on the computer itself. With time and better technology, computers became able to save more data. But with the dawning of the internet in the 1990s, it started to become possible to declutter our desks by keeping it somewhere else entirely. What the internet provided was connectivity between an individual device that was on my desk, data centers, and that's plural, data centers sort of everywhere, and that became essentially the beginning of the cloud. The cloud was really the internet and my ability to connect multiple devices, whether those were in data centers or resident on someone's desk. So the internet and our ability to transfer information over the internet meant that that data could be stored anywhere. Absolutely. You are correct. Wow. Very warm in here. This BBC reporter is visiting a massive underground data centre in Norway. Let me explain why it's so warm. These are the back of the servers. You can see them all flashing away. Now, each one of these is pumping out heat and there are 40 servers in there, and 40 servers in there, and hundreds and thousands all the way down here. Companies were able to move their data servers to places where land was cheaper, and sometimes found they'd built much more computing space than they needed. But they quickly discovered they could rent it out. Over time, organisations got a lot smarter and said, well... If I had a data center and it was really large and I had a lot of compute power and I had a lot of storage, could I not sell part of that compute power and storage to someone else? And this is where we started to see cloud providers, uh, what we commonly term today as hyperscalers, who were creating these very large data centers all over the world and essentially selling or renting 
space in those data centers for organizations and indeed individuals to use. The first major hyperscaler was Amazon. The tech giant launched Amazon Web Services in 2006. Over time, many other major tech companies have developed their own cloud storage solutions. Today, the cloud services market is worth over $500 billion per year and projected to be worth eight times that amount in a decade. For the many companies and individuals who use the cloud, they see data storage quite simply as one less thing to worry about. I don't necessarily know, and I'm probably not very good at predicting, how much compute power or storage that I need. We need the ability to be very flexible and to quickly, potentially, very quickly, be able to scale the amount of storage or processing power that I need. If I do that in my own resident device or my own resident data center, that requires me to purchase hardware and purchase software and install it, which is very time consuming. Individuals and businesses using data centers also save on the cost of investing in expensive computer storage equipment. When I go and I install an amount of security or storage in my private data center, but I don't actually use it, I'm still paying for it. If I'm using a hyperscaler or a cloud platform, I'm only paying for what I'm using. I don't pay for what I don't use. And so my fixed cost is very low and I'm paying based on my consumption. That's really the power, one of the largest reasons why I might, I might use cloud computing. Who then are the companies behind the massive growth of cloud computing? Time for our second expert witness. Part two, the cloud storers. I'm Laurel Ruma, and I'm the Global Editorial Director for the MIT Technology Review. I run the custom content team here at Tech Review. Technology giants Microsoft, Google and Amazon dominate the cloud market with over three quarters of global revenues. But by far the biggest of the three is Amazon, which controls a third of the market. For those of us who can remember that far back, Amazon started out in 1995 selling books. But the company soon grew into a broader platform for retailers – and it needed to build large amounts of capacity to store data. Anything it had spare, it began to offer to its customers for a fee. As Amazon grew as this online marketplace, it was also easy to then kind of turn to what one might consider ancillary services, and that actually became Amazon's primary business, which is to help companies run more efficiently in a bigger scale, much like Amazon itself had to. Some people would say, look at Amazon, how much success they've had, how do we do that for our company as well? And then Amazon would then start providing these services around it, cloud being the primary one. Amazon's offer to businesses swiftly attracted the attention of its Silicon Valley tech rivals. There was no way that Amazon was going to be able to lead the crowd without Microsoft and Google also kind of getting in the game. Google has always had a very strong cloud services product you know, not just for everyday users, but also for companies. And of course, Microsoft is very uh, ingrained in companies, everything from your email to your the way that you write articles every day. So it wasn't too far of a stretch to think, well, if Microsoft is already giving me my email, they can give it to me in a better way and a more easy way and more online way. And so I can check my email while I'm at the grocery store buying tonight's supper. And this is part of those cloud services. So when we think about cloud services, it really is thinking about an entire infrastructure that makes up this access to space in the cloud. We are talking about the way that things are now easier to do online, from online banking to shopping to working. And it's easier to do these things online because we have a robust telecommunications network. And we have a robust telecommunications network because investments have been made in physical infrastructure. And so this enormous technical framework behind cloud computing is a, is a physical infrastructure and it still takes up space. 
like servers in data centers. Can you equate having lots of cloud storage in a country or availability of cloud storage with the economic success of a country? Is there a correlation there? Countries that have a lot of investment in telecoms, in data centers, also in education and building a workforce that can actually work in the technological services industry really makes a big difference. And having this way of looking at technology as an enabler for not just companies, but also for people and also for governments. So the more technologically advanced the government is, the more technologically advanced the citizens will be of that country. Being a cloud forward country does not just mean technologically adept, you must also invest in people. But as all of this data capacity was growing, some companies found they were racking up extra costs because it was by now just a little bit too easy to buy more space just by flipping a switch. It's much like a thermostat in your own house where you will turn it up when you're cold, but you may not know how much you're spending in energy until you get the bill at the end of the month. And for cost-conscious um, companies, having this ability to have unlimited amount of cloud can be really tricky. And when it comes to trying to save money and focus on spending, that kind of unknown spending can be a bit tricky for companies. And large invoices weren't the only thing to worry about. Companies putting data into the cloud also needed to consider how they would manage if they suddenly had trouble getting it back out again time for our third expert witness. Part three, security. So I think it's well known that uh, you can't just put data into certain regions of the world unless you have some reason why it should be there. Cloud technology offers us the freedom to store data far away from the place in which it's being used. But that doesn't mean we can park it anywhere and forget about it. My name is Bill Buchanan and I'm a professor at Edinburgh Napier University. Countries and regions across the world have different laws governing how data can be used. In 2018, the European Union introduced what it describes as the toughest data privacy law in the world. The law is called GDPR, and it dictates how organisations both inside and outside the EU use information about individuals in Europe. It can be quite a messy infrastructure that we have that we base our data in regions of the world and we must comply with the data regulations and compliance within that region if we leak data into other regions, we could be open to serious uh, breaches of uh, audit and compliance regulations. This suggests that we might do better to keep data in the same jurisdiction as where it originates. But this alone doesn't stop things going wrong. In the final weeks of 2021, Amazon Web Services suffered a series of outages. On December the 7th, a software glitch in Northern Virginia led to many websites and online services going out of action for several hours. An outage on Amazon Web Services today stopped the company from being able to deliver packages in some places. The problems impacted thousands, and not just Amazon itself, but also entertainment sites like Disney Plus and Netflix. Amazon says it has identified the cause and is seeing signs of recovery. In January of this year, Amazon announced it would invest tens of billions of dollars more in its data centres. What most companies will do is to be able to fail over into another region, which means they must synchronise their data and their services and their networking to fail over into another region to be able to cope with that. So if one of those data centres goes down, has a power failure, or there's an explosion, then the other five data centres in that region will automatically kick in. And as much as possible, that should be automated. So it shouldn't be human intervention that makes that happen automatically. Another concern about using the internet to send data back and forth is precisely which countries it passes through on its travels and whether it may be exposed to malicious actors along its journey. The internet has very little human intervention in the way that that it works. It's just too complex to really have humans 
looking after the, or the routing of every single data packet. So it can happen that routes can be enabled that, that really are quite malicious and it might take some time to realise that this has happened. The internet is fairly autonomous, so the structure that we have is what we have. If we were designing the internet now, then it would be completely different to the way it was created initially. Bill says as we store more and more data away from where it's actually needed, the risks associated with not being able to get access to it are getting bigger and more serious. We're now putting safety critical and life critical data systems into the public cloud. Aircraft control, airline controls and and a lot of military systems uh, are starting to move into the public cloud. It's a natural thing, but if that capability is taken away, then we could uh, end up that people could die, planes could fall from the sky, operations wouldn't go ahead, and so on. So any company who moves into the cloud needs to understand the resilience uh, of their data, especially in a, in a safety critical and a life threatening situation. The other thing Bill says it's important to think about is the health of your relationship with your data services provider. One weakness is that companies become tied in to their cloud provider. Companies need to understand if the worst happened, if Amazon went bust tomorrow, how would they be able to move their cloud and all their data and everything into another cloud? With every passing day, more and more parts of our economies are heading into the cloud and we're generating more and more data. Over two-thirds of the world's economy has now undergone digitisation. And just in terms of emails, we're sending over 300 billion of them every day. All of this is digital, but that doesn't mean that it comes as zero cost to the environment. Time for our fourth expert witness. Part four, how green is the cloud? From an environmental perspective, cloud computing is a big source of carbon emissions. So the estimates vary, but it's something around two to 3% globally of the, our total carbon emissions are due to this sector, due to uh, cloud computing. That's actually comparable to commercial aviation. Dr. Emma Fitzgerald is from Lund University in Sweden from the Department of Electrical and Information Technology. She explains that it's not only the servers themselves which are using lots of energy, but also the systems needed to keep them running. If you think about a computer, it's doing something, but it's not really producing anything. So all of the energy that it draws from the electricity grid more or less ends up as heat one way or another. And you've got to get rid of that heat because you can't have computers running in a too hot environment. It's not very good for them. So all of the calculations uh, and computations that you're doing turn into heat and you need to cool them. Not only do they need cooling systems, data centres need to have secondary energy systems in case there's a power failure. And these generators are often run on diesel. The idea of the cloud is you should have uninterrupted service. It, it basically should never go down, ideally, which means a lot of work is put into making sure there is a backup power system, which is often not as sustainable, not as environmentally friendly as the main energy that the data centre might be using. Emma says cloud companies do, however, have a very strong incentive to reduce their impact on the environment. They are paying the electricity bill, so it's always in their best interest to make things more energy efficient. There is a big interest and there is a lot of work going into different strategies for how can we reduce the energy usage, how can we make things more efficient, how can we take advantage of renewable energy to try and make these fairly power-hungry data centres less of a problem in that respect. Social media giant Facebook has found one clever solution – putting data centres in the north of Sweden. The reason for that is simply that it's very cold there. So for much of the year, they get essentially free cooling and actually the excess heat from those data centres can then be used to power homes in that area. 
So that's a very nice example of where you're still maybe using a lot of energy, but if you can make it be renewable energy or if you can do something smart with the cooling system like that, then you can continue cloud computing and otherwise maybe you're running into those environmental concerns where you don't, you might be physically capable of of continuing and making it bigger and faster and better all the time, but you might not want to because of uh, concerns about the emissions. Meanwhile, the huge demand for data storage seems only likely to continue to spiral. Videos already make up a large part of the data pie and there's huge growth in demand for augmented and virtual reality. Environmental concerns aside, the cost of energy alone has, particularly recently, become a large consideration. A lot of startups aren't always profitable to begin with. So if you think about a startup running in in the video space, there might be less margin for error or less time that you can run on venture capital before they might start to ask, um, how are you going to monetize this? And if you think that costs for cloud services increase, then that becomes a much harder equation to put together that you can actually make a video service like that and make it profitable and make it attractive to the end users. So now we return to our question. Will we ever run out of cloud storage? Well, it appears that we can always opt to build more and data storage itself, just like other technology, will get ever smaller. The biggest limitation on cloud storage is less the land it takes up or even the materials it uses to build the servers, but the worryingly large impact it has on the planet. As the amount of data generated rises exponentially, this is only going to become a larger and larger source of concern. So what might encourage us to start cutting back on some of our data files? I wonder what message you would give to companies who store, or individuals who just store too much and probably need to do a bit of a declutter. In most organizations, I think what we've seen is It's not necessarily that the data itself is costing them a lot of money to have in their environment or to store in the environment. It's more the cost of there being so much data that I have difficulty finding the right data to answer my question. I think that's where most organizations have come to the realization that they really need to to normalize for simplicity's sake so that they can actually find the data that will bring them insights more quickly, more easily. This inquiry was presented by me, Tanya Beckett, produced by Phil Revel, researched by John Cosset, edited by Tara McDermott, and mixed by Richard Hannaford. One of the most dangerous and prolific criminal hacking gangs in the world. They're accused of robbing banks, stealing secrets, and causing mayhem everywhere from hospitals to Hollywood. Investigators say they're working on the orders of the North Korean state. A claim dismissed by the regime as an attempt to tarnish the country's image. A sovereign nation trying to earn revenue to fund weapons of mass destruction. $2.1 billion in stolen funds. In season two of The Lazarus Heist, from the BBC World Service. We're picking up from where season one left off. Far from disappearing into the shadows, it seems the Lazarus Group has been busy. We have tracked your funds to a North Korean account. Carrying out ever more elaborate money grabs. Coordinating in more than 20 countries. And they're not working alone. He organized money laundering operations. They found over $100,000 cash under his mattress. Search for The Lazarus Heist wherever you get your BBC podcasts.